Good evening and thank you for joining us for this week's edition of Sunday Interview. I am your host, Gravazio Zulu. Now, Zambia has in the last two years faced a turbulent time economically. Low metal prices, unstable exchange rate, energy crisis, and many others have all combined to put pressure on the country's economy. Add to that high debt levels, inconsistent policies, and uncontrolled spending. The talk for now is economic recovery and stabilization. With the International Monetary Fund tipped to come on board to help stabilize the economy, debate is on as to whether this is what the country needs. My guest this evening is the Minister of Finance, Honorable Felix Mtati. Sir, welcome to the program. Great pleasure. Many thanks, and it's good to be on Sunday interview. Now, I'll start with the elephant in the room, International Monetary Fund, the IMF. This is a much talked about economic engagement, and as we understand, the IMF is now in the country and having discussions with you. What is on the table? Uh, first of all, let me put um, a couple of things in perspective. Before we come to what you refer to as the elephant in the room, one is that as a nation, nobody's going to be able to change our circumstances except ourselves. We need to remain in control of our destiny. We need to guard our problems and own them. That is very important. Number two is that the real value of money is in its efficient and effective use and not in the quantum. And then three, that development, however defined, is a huge effort. Okay? It's a very huge effort. We must be able to work in a clear and clarified direction, being alert to the potential dangers that lie ahead. And President Lungu made it very clear that on our development path, consultation, dialogue, and collective wisdom should be the energy that drives us in order to realize vision 2030 and sometimes Gravazio, you have to amputate the limb in order to save a life you have already made reference to the economic circumstances and just in summary in the last two years we had challenges driven by two elections and those had an impact on the economy we also had challenges to deal with climate change, resulting in power deficit up to 50% of generation. That had significant impact on economic growth, major impact. We also had challenges in terms of commodity prices. Our main export commodity copper went as low as 4,500 US dollars per ton. The combination of these three factors made it difficult for us to achieve our economic targets. For example, in 2016, our growth was under 3%. Our, res our reserves were down. You have already made reference to the debt levels. Yes, the debt levels were rising and we closed close to 7 billion US dollars. So given those circumstances, as government we sat and say, how do we achieve stability as a basis of growing the economy? What do we need to do? And we developed some of the key principles. And one of the principles we developed as government is that you cannot spend money that you don't have. Mm -hmm. Neither should you borrow beyond your capacity to be able to repair. Those are the principles. Given those principles, we then constructed a stability and recovery plan, which was going to address both policy and structural issues as key drivers for growth. And we felt this was critically important. And I want to explain to the people of Zambia what these issues actually are. So you, you are now looking at uh, the economic recovery plan. Yes. Uh, and 
quite a number of these issues. A lot of people say are, are self-imposed, self-inflicted, inconsistent policies. We're looking at um, excessive spending. And these are not externally driven. These are internal issues. Are we now on a clear path, like you say, you need to amputate the limb to survive? What you must understand is, for example, climate change, low water levels. Obviously, you have a choice immediately. Do you succumb to the low water levels or import power in order to drive economic growth? A decision was made that you needed to import power, and imported power was very expensive. Consequently, government had to subsidize some level of that imported power. Okay. We had in agriculture, for example, the FISIP. A considerable amount had to be spent on FISIP. Amount spent subsidizing agriculture. So all we are saying is that, yes, these are critical problems which affected the performance of the economy, particularly last year. The combination of subsidies in power, electricity, subsidy in fuel, and agriculture had the effect of accumulating massive areas in terms of suppliers of goods and services, in terms of our inability to be able to undertake the projects that we plan to take. And consequently, by the end of 2016, you had areas building up close to 12, 13 billion kwacha because monies were diverted, critically so, to subsidize power imports. And the totality of that subsidy last year was close to 1 billion US dollars. And therefore, government had to take critical decisions, bold decisions, that if we're going to grow this economy, let's deal with the elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room was one, implement reforms, critical reforms. We took the decision last year in, in November to remove the subsidy in fuel, 100%. Today, the price of fuel is market driven. We have also said as government that beginning the 1st of July, government will no longer procure fuel. This will be done by the private sector. And that will have the impact to relieve a lot of pressure on the Treasury. And that will push uh, the cost of uh, fuel up. We removed subsidies in November. Yes, there was an increment in the cost of fuel. But subsequently, as the international market subsided, you saw a reduction in the cost of fuel. And all we are saying, Gravacho, is that let us spend money as effective and as efficient so that we're able to create value. How but well has this, has this move been thought out, Minister? The argument is that we've been this route before. We, we've, we've allowed the private sector to, to import fuel, and, and it failed. We had to revert. And are we going that route again? No, how, no, how, no. how much work has been done? No, Gravacho, a lot of work has been done. You recall in the budget, we said from the 1st of April, we are going to have private sector procurement of fuel. The Minister of Energy sat with finance and a number of colleagues. And we said to ourselves that we needed to do critical work in terms of how does the private sector procure? How do we ensure that the supply of fuel is constant and we don't endanger the economy. And a lot of work has been done by the Minister of Energy. They have been to every province. They have spoken to key private sector participants, both external and internal, to ensure that we have a platform of procurement that is going to be sustainable, that is going to be dependable, that is not going to be interrupted. So a lot of work has been done, and it is for that reason that we moved the implementation of procurement from the 1st of April to the 1st of July, so that we can do the critical work, 
so that we do not again reverse a critical measure that we have done. I think that it's being done correctly. So you've spoken uh, about subsidies in fuel, subsidies on electricity and subsidies on, uh, on FISIP. Which one is next to go? Fuel is gone. Uh, next is energy. N next, electricity. next what, what we have done is that uh, we are subsidizing a colossal amount in terms of power imports. And we can't afford. The effect of continued subsidy in power is in excess of $30 million every month. That money can be used for public investment. For us, for example, to finish the Chingola Kito Road. For us to be able to put in money for the Chingola Solezi Road. For us to attend to the Great North Road. For us to be able to invest in education infrastructure, in health infrastructure, which impacts on the majority of our people. So we are saying that we are going to remove on a gradual basis the subsidy in electricity. Number two. Moving towards cost reflective tariffs, yes, in other words. Number, and, and number two, we have already engaged a consultant that is going to undertake the critical work in order to be able to move to cost reflective tariffs. And we think this exercise should be completed perhaps June, July, you know, this year. But certainly by the end of this year, as a country, we shall move to cost reflective tariff so that we can begin to minimize. For the ordinary person, you're yeah. basically saying by the end of this year, uh, we are increasing electricity tariffs. For the ordinary person, and put it simply, we are going to do it in two phases. Number one, we are going to have an increment before the outputs of the cost of service study. Number two, that cost of service study will tell us what is the right level of tariff. The tariff may indeed go up. The tariff may marginally go up. The tariff may remain the same. We cannot tell now until the consultant has, has finished the work. But it will it give us a platform that will be used for the purpose of determining what the tariffs must be. And everybody that must run the economy should be able to say, at what level must I be able to deliver a service that meets my cost of providing that particular service? And that is the crux of the matter. And that is what cost re reflectivity actually means. So we are moving in that direction. And you, you raised issues about the IMF, you know, when you started. What is IMF? W what I want to, to say, Gravajo, is that most of the people of Zambia who recall that in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s, and the early 2000s, we had various programs under IMF. And typically, the IMF put together a prescription of things that must be done, you understand, without examining the patient. So you have a doctor that makes a prescription, has not examined the patient, and you expect that medicine to work. The answer is critically no. And that is why the historical programs and IMF did not work. They resulted in a lot of hardship, particularly for economy. Admittedly, there were other issues internally that we needed to deal with, but prescriptions never work. Having a common solution for different problems was a key challenge, and that's why we experienced the consequences of hardship in the previous program. Even IMF itself, Christian Lagarde, the managing director, has said, when the music changes, the dance must change. There's been significant reform by the members of IMF, including Zambia, that there must be a new approach in dealing with the challenges that countries face. And this new approach basically emphasizes on three things. 
that any solution to some the challenges that the country faces must be country led and that is why in the case of Zambia we have constructed the Zambia Plus economic recovery program. You still have a lot of work to do, Minister, to convince people that IMF is that much dreaded institution and realistic and imposes this one-size-fits-all solutions on a country. And, and we know that IMF is not going to walk in here and listen to you probably. They will come with their own solutions and conditions attached. Uh, Grevajo, when was IMF last year, let me ask, just to test, you know, to test you, if you recall. I know that IMF was here in November 2016. 2016. But when did you have the last program for IMF? Well, I'm doing the interview, so <laughs> I probably don't know the of that. But <laughs> <laughs> no, but no but the, the point that I want to make is to answer very frankly the issue that you raise. If you recall, in 2008, up to 2011, we had an IMF program. We had an IM program because we had challenges in commodity prices. We had challenges in the external position, that is our reserves. We undertook the IMF program in that period. And if you wind back, tell me, what are the issues that you remember in that period? So the point we are making is that the direction of IMF, even now going forward, is going to be best, one, on a program that is homegrown, constructed by ourselves, and they have to fit in. You, you can ask me, what are the issues that typically the IMF have been raising with us over the last few years, including when they were here last year? As you know, every year the IMF comes to Zambia as a matter of routine, as part of the conditions for us to belong to the IMF club members. The issues that they have raised is one, issues around subsidies. Two, they have e raised issues around the levels of debt. Three, they have raised issues around the build-up of areas. Now, these issues that they have raised in our recovery program, we have dealt already and taken the bold decisions. Have they raised issues around past titles? The IMF in the past, they have raised issues around past titles. We said in our budget. Is that the reason why you listed those things in the budget and say we, you're we, going to deal with we, the past titles that are not performing? Revazo, we said in the budget that we are going to undertake a study of the parastatals. And those that are not performing, we have to make a decision. There's absolutely no way that government should continue to spend money from the treasury in order to support parastatals. So we need to shake them up and be able to say that this money that we are getting, which is limited, must be invested in generating infrastructure that is going to support economic growth. Now, that is not an IMF issue. That decision must be taken by ourselves because it's us who are responsible for growing the economy. So all those things that are slowing us down in terms of growing the economy, those decisions we must take ourselves. We, I don't need IMF to tell me that subsidies are hurting the economy. I don't need IMF to come and tell me that these borrowings are unsustainable. I don't need IMF to tell me that I need to increase my domestic revenue collection. I don't need them to come and tell me that they mu I must exercise prudence in terms of how I spend the money. That I don't need them. Those are the things that we must do as our daily bread, as prudent management of the economy. And that is what we have constructed, a homegrown economic program with those key features. So we have done the heavy lifting ourselves. We have done the heavy lifting, the difficult decisions 
that so, must be taken. In Have a, already been taken. In a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a brief statement, what exactly does government want from the IMF? In, in the brief statement is what? IMF, in its new approach, focuses on three things. Okay? Number one is that they are going to support a country with balance of payment, meaning the external position, meaning that they will support us on our reserves. As you recall, Gravazio, because our debt level, as at the end of 2016, we said it's almost 7 billion US dollars. Last year, on debt servicing alone, we paid almost half a billion US dollars. And that amount in 2017 is likely to go up. And that will have to be procured from the reserves that we have got. So you need to beef up your reserves, your balance of payment, and that's what they support. Number two, they also open other financing options to support economic growth. For example, increased grants, increased budget support, increased concessional lending. Those are options that will be open to us. Three, there's critical focus on social protection. We are already doing social cash transfer. Even when we deal with the tariffs, there's going to be a cushion and not for the poor because we don't need to hurt the poor. Three, we need to have inclusive growth. So all we are saying is that what is this package? It may be plus minus 1.3 billion US dollars. Cost close to zero. And you can't get anything cheaper than, cheaper than zero. All we are saying, it is a critical option that the country must be able to consider in order to deal primarily with the external position, the balance of payment, so that it can be an engine to generate the critical growth that we need so that we don't endanger debt servicing, so that we don't endanger our reserves, so that we don't endanger our balance of payment support. Those things, Gervasio, are critical. So this is what government wants. Now, yeah. here's another contrary view that government does not need additional resources from the IMF, but technical assistance. This is a correct position. Part of the things that IMF offers and they've been offering us for so many years is technical support. They have supported us at Bank of Zambia, at Zambia Revenue Authority. They have also supported us, particularly in debt sustainability analysis at the Ministry of Finance. And I think for me, that critical support, technical support, will continue to be relevant as we create capacity in these institutions for us to be able to do that job. So that is an ongoing exercise. So what as you boost your technical capabilities on one hand you also need the resource in order to create economic growth in order to create the jobs in order to ensure that you don't endanger the country particularly from the debt servicing perspective is zambia ascending to the imf program when are we yeah. ascending what we're doing at the moment is that we are in consultation we're we are in discussion with the IMF, discussing with them what are the features. And I can tell the nation through you that they have not raised any issues that are outside the issues that we are already doing as enshrined in the 2017 budget, as enshrined in the medium term expenditure programs. The only focus that they are putting forward is what will be the benchmarks going forward. Now, these benchmarks are issues around one, economic growth for this year, for next year, for the year after. What are the debt levels that are going to be sustainable? What is the physical deficit that the country must continue to have? How much resource must we procure from cooperating partners? Those are benchmarks. And for, for me, that is a sensible platform. 
There's nothing IMF about. Those are the things that day to day, as government, we're doing. Is there, is, there, is there a deadline as to when you're concluding these talks and finally ascending to this program? There is no deadline. There's no deadline. We're doing the consultations. Once the picture has been properly put, I'm going to take it to cabinet and say, this is the way the program looks like. Cabinet will examine. And as usual, we are going to engage the people of Zambia. And leading to the point where we are Grivajo, we have had many consultations. We have had many consultations internally and externally, trying to outline the challenges we face, the options that we have got. Who, who and, have you been uh, consulting, Minister? Sorry to, to, to ask you that question. And who have you been consulting exactly? And, if, if, and if, 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 if you recall... How wide has the consultation be, been? Is it, is, it, is it among technocrats, your technocrats? Is no, it with no, the unions? No, no, no. Is, no, no, is, is, no. is it with, 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 with other parties, <laughs> political parties? Have you, have, you been, have you gone that route? We, we have consulted. Extensive? Maybe not. But we have ex you know, consulted recently. We, we had, for example, with the Economic Association of Zambia, they put up a discussion point where we had representation from employers, from trade unions, from academia, from finance, and other stakeholders where this matter was discussed. Subsequently, we had an open debate at Pamozi where we had opposition parties, civil society, and many other interest groups where these matters were, were debated. We also had consultation with the private sector on these matters. Zaki, the Manufacturing Association, and many other stakeholders in the private sector. And I can tell you, the sense from most of these stakeholders, you take civil society, they were saying that government, you must exercise caution, particularly when it comes to social protection. And subsidies, social protection uh, versus subsidies. Yes, social protection, which is issues around social cash transfer issues around having a tariff structure that has got the levels of social protection. The private sector, we are focusing on us. How do we maintain stability? How do we maintain a framework where we are inducing liquidity in the marketplace, where we are getting the cost of money to climb down? And as you have seen, the Bank of Zambia has taken some critical decision. They are easing the reserve ratio. They are easing the policy rate. The cost of money has become to go down a little bit. So these are the critical consultations, even from the academia, we have discussed quite extensively. Have you consulted your predecessors that, that probably ran with these programs before you? If you recall, Honorable Musokotani was uh, you know, I ran a program 2008 to 2011 on, on uh, IMF, and he has been uh, a beacon of wisdom on this particular matter. Mr. Nawakwe, Mr. Magande? Mr. Magande, we have spoken. Ms. Nawakwe, you know, we have spoken, but not in much detail. But the critical point that I'm making is that they are saying you need the reforms that support job creation, you need the reforms that deal with those things that are obstacles to growth, such as subsidy. And this is a clear message. Do you have a buy-in, maybe to ask? Do you have a buy-in from, from the public, from Zambians per se? I think so. I think, uh, in, including yourself, I, I can see that your body language <laughs> indicates that uh, uh, it's something that we must consider. At the end of the day, as government, we have a responsibility to steer the economy going forward. At the end of the day, we must take the board decision to make sure that we, we, we create the jobs. And for me, that is very important. There may be challenges ahead, but these challenges are not insurmountable. Are you making this, this thing look so good and... and Avoiding to tell the people the reality that 
we're going to have to tighten the belt. What we're telling is a reality. The reality is that we have done the heavy lifting. We have removed the subsidy. That is reality. That is not making it look good. The reality is that we, are, we have taken the necessary reforms in the agriculture sector, moving from FISIP to EVAJA. That is the reality. It's not a good view, you know, situation. The reality is that we are going to have procurement of fuel by the private sector. That is the reality. It's not a good fuel situation. And everybody knows. So we are not saying one thing and doing something else. We are saying what we are doing, walking the talk. Let's look at your, 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 the, the economic recovery plan called uh, Zambia Plus. Does it change uh, when you get onto the IMF program? Maybe become Zambia Plus Plus? <laughs> it will remain Zambia, Zambia Plus. Zambia I know Plus. that you, you yeah. carry ties <laughs> under that recovery program. You have undertaken to, to, to dismantle arrears due to contractors to help companies meet their obligation. How well are you doing with this? In, in the Zambia Plus, we felt that the economy was slowing down partly because government owed colossal amounts to contractors, to suppliers of services. We have in the last three months, or slightly beyond that, been able to pay over three billion to contractors. Three billion quachas? Quachas, yes. And as a consequence of that revision, we have seen a revival of activity a revival of jobs, a revival of action. We have also, as a consequence of that, been able to collect some taxes that were locked up in the areas. Just we have oil. also been able to begin to dismantle the areas associated with pensioners so that we can bring back life to people that have rendered the service but who remained unpaid. So our focus on dismantling areas this year is one of our key priorities. Our focus on ensuring that the levels of debt are kept within sustainable levels is going to be the focus of this year. Our efforts to ensure that there is prudent use of the meager resources that we have got is going to be crucial this year. In terms of revenue generation, we are saying in Zambia Plus, how can we minimize wastage? How can we begin to have tax compliance? How can we improve on tax administration so that we can continue to boost the revenues that come into Treasury? These are the things that constitute the Zambia Plus. Your Zambia Plus program has been attacked for, for clearly squeezing the middle class and SMEs out of every coin that they earn. They have to pay uh, uh, parking fees, electricity, fuel, food, road tax, tolls, and pay as you earn. But you, it's you, like you, you, this you, small you, community yeah. has to shoulder the entire development program for the country. No well, tax base being broadened. What we must answer to, uh, Gravajo, is that we have a small economy. We have a very small economy. We have limited you know, uh, resource. And whatever we're able to generate as a nation, let's put it to drive the economy. So if I squeeze, for example, under toffees, the money that we're accumulating under toffees, in part, they are helping government to maintain the roads. In part, they are helping government to build roads. In part, they are helping government to be able to liquidate some of the areas for those that are maintaining roads. Now, this is important as a way of beginning to grow the economy. I know I'm going to ask you about broadening the tax base, but let me focus on the issue of, of taxes and getting so many taxes out of the same community, same group of people. Look, let's look at uh, uh, people that drive, people with vehicles. They're going to pay toll fees for road maintenance. They're going to pay road levy. They're going to pay road tax. All these taxes around 
one group and aimed for the same purpose. Why don't you harmonize them? No. Gravajo. Fio Levy. Toffees. Road taxes. May appear to be different forms of taxes. Aimed at addressing one issue. Aimed at addressing the critical issue of road infrastructure. And you know that we have a colossal deficit of road infrastructure, which we must continue to address. And unless we address the deficit in road infrastructure, we are going to get to a situation where we endanger economic growth. So the responsibility, like I said, to deal with our circumstances remains with ourselves. And the taxes that we are collecting are being reinvested in dealing with expansion and maintenance of the road infrastructure, the taxes that I've alluded to. Shouldn't be, this be harmonized other than being hidden in different names and making people look like they're paying different taxes? Government doesn't hide anything. It tells you fuel levy transparently, toll fees transparently, Road tax. Road tax is transparent. We'll never hide. All for road infrastructure. Why do yeah. we harmonize them really? Then? All tr done transparently. Okay. Harmonizing. Take, take toffee. Not everybody will drive, for example, on the Chingola Kito Road. So those that are using specific roads will pay a toffee. And that fee will be used to maintain that particular road. So all we are saying is that take the maintenance agenda as close to the people that are using them. Instead of charging a toll fee across a nation, it is targeted to address critical demand of usage. You understand the toll fee. Let's look at um, SMEs. I, I know that you've put this as one of the um, takeoff measures for, your, for, for the Zambia uh, Plus economic recovery program. But when they have so many taxes to pay, are you not squeezing the money out of them? Killing well, the same baby you're trying to raise. Pay them their, their, their arrears and get with the left hand. Pay them with the right hand. Grab with the left hand. Is that, is that the situation? I mean? uh, Grivajo, what, what you must be able to appreciate is that what are the key challenges that most of SMEs face in this country? In our engagements with the SMEs, they have indicated to government that access to financing and cost of financing is what is impeding their growth. In the budget for 2017, we announced a number of measures that are aimed at addressing issues around the SMEs. Number one, we said we are going to create an agriculture and industrial credit guarantee scheme where government is going to cushion the collateral component for the purpose of borrowing by SMEs by 50%. We have been working with the banking community to put together this guarantee scheme. And our plan is that it will be operational from April next year, uh, April next month, number one. Number two, we have also been able to create a fund, 75 million US dollars, to support SMEs in terms of access. And these are long-term funds so that they can be able to grow. So we, we are addressing issues around cost, around collateral, Lack, for, around lack of financing. Are people around, accessing these funds that you've created? Usually we create these good funds and, and, and they end up as white elephants and eventually disappear. We have been working, for example, on the credit guarantee fund. We expect that the exercise will be completed by the end of this month. The rules of engagement will be announced from the 1st of April so that the A SMEs can begin to access. Similarly, the fund, the 75 million US dollars, the rules of engagement 
will be announced from the 1st of April so that the people can be able to begin to access. We don't want to create funds that remain as white elephants. We want to achieve the quality in terms of how do they access these funds. Let everybody know. And we also want to emphasize that these funds are meant to assist the SMEs, to grow the business, to create the jobs. These funds should not be misapplied. They should be used for the purpose for which they are secured. You, 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 you've spoken about positively about the economy that's now taking off. And one would ask the indicators, of course, apart from the statistics from CSO uh, on inflation, what are other indicators that people should look out to and say, well, the economy is growing, the economy is doing fine, the creation of jobs, for instance. It should be one of the indicators. 2017, obviously, we've only done January and uh, February. There are some signs. It takes a lot of time in order to create a trend, isn't it? You have already made reference to one, inflation is down. The quacha is stable. The cost of money is trending downwards. Liquidity is easing. We have seen in the last two months that participation, particularly by foreign investors in government security, has tremendously increased. And therefore, it's an indication that foreign investors have increased confidence in the economy. So these are signs, positive signs, which we need to build upon in terms of getting the economy to move forward. We are also pressing Zambia Revenue Authority to continue to exert administrative and compliance measures in order to meet their revenue targets. And I think they're doing the best that they can. They still have challenges, of course, when you speak about interest rates easing downwards, they still remain high for an ordinary person. So the cost of money is still very expensive. Yes. But when you look at uh, exchange rate, still... It's, it's, it's 9.5 9, 9 to a dollar, stable. At least it's... Look it's, at the it's, trade, it's, trade it's balance. It's, uh, it's, uh, trade uh, deficit. The, the trade deficit... It's still widening, not, not no, easing. No, no, no. The, the trade deficit is actually narrowing down. The trade deficit from October last year to now is actually declining. So when the trade deficit declines, it means that the economy is beginning to breathe. It means that the pressure on our reserves is beginning to ease. It means that the current account deficit is also beginning to ease. And these are positive signs. And we're going to continue pushing until we can get positive trade deficit positive current account balances. That is the direction. Interest rates? Interest rates, they are going to continue to come down. Because the Bank of Zambia, one, has reduced the reserve ratio. Two, they have reduced the policy rate. And they are taking measures, particularly in agriculture, to de-risk lending to agriculture sector. And you know that the sector is the one that has got and remains vulnerable to default. So if we can attend to those issues, particularly in agriculture, then the admin cost associated with the provisions that banks must create because of people defaulting will be reduced and therefore making it a lot easier for people to borrow. How do you intend to deal with the, with the fiscal deficit in the 2017 budget? Uh, in the budget for 2017, we have said the target for the fiscal deficit is 7%. What are the measures? One, we are undertaking what we are calling the debt sustainability analysis, ensuring that we don't borrow beyond the 7% level. We are also doing fiscal consolidation, that our expenditure is kept within the confines of what we have budgeted for. We are also undertaking critical reforms, particularly in the Public Finance Act, carrying out necessary amendments. We are also undertaking 
reforms in the budget and planning bill. These things are important to ensure that physical consolidation is achieved in 2017. And we think that this will enable us to remain within the 7% fiscal deficit for this year. You, you, you've spoken about fiscal discipline, and this seems to be your underlining theme. How are you ensuring that you stick to that? Because it's been a major problem for government. I've already made reference Spending to... Spending only what you have. I've already made reference to the amendments that we're undertaking with the Public Finance Act. We're going to put more teeth in terms of misapplication of funds, in terms with irregularities, so that we can begin to give meaning to the outputs of the Auditor General's report. Give it teeth. And these amendments are coming. Number two, we have also strengthened what we are calling the commitment control so that we ensure that we stick to the budget so that our systems which are being automated will reject any expenditure that is outside the budget. That is are, are you winning with that? We've seen recent pronouncements in the past. For instance, salaries for councillors increased from 700 to 3,000 kwacha. Uh, we've seen pronouncements that of uh, increased budget allocation, the Ministry of Gender, are all these catered for? In, in the budget for councillors, under what we're calling grants to the councils, there, there was already a provision in the budget. It may not be adequate, but we already have a provision for the, all the things that we're announcing we have already had a provision in the budget. Was that a provision for development issues, provision for um, emoluments? You varied the expenditure? The, the provisions in the budget are very, very clear for the councils and also for the Ministry of Gender. We provided for the activities in the budget for grants in aid. And the critical component of that grant in aid is to cushion the emoluments of the councils. It is there in the budget. That's number one. The Ministry of Gender, in terms of the programs to support women, that provision is existing in the budget. We, we've had disasters this year, pests affecting crops, infrastructure being damaged, uh, roads to mention a few, and all these need funding. How have you handled them? We have, have we, we, outside we, the budget? We, we have had um, challenges, one, if you recall, the army worms. Towards the end of last year, beginning this year, we have had army worms. We have had good rains. But the flip side of good rains is that a number of schools have had their roofs blown off, some bridges, you know, washed away and indeed other forms of disaster. At the moment, we are attending to those disasters out of our contingent budget. We have 75 million kwacham that has been provided for in 2017 in order to address disasters. But we're also conscious of the fact that the level of disasters that we have experienced thus far has been significant to the extent that over 50% of what we provided for under contingency has already been spent. We are most likely going to approach Parliament in June to be able to lift through supplementary spending funds available for disaster management and our thinking is very clear that part of the funds that will be available for disaster management may have to come from the favorable prices that we have for metals. In the budget, we budgeted for 4,500 per metric ton. We are now close to 6,000. So there will be some extra income that can be used to cushion the disasters as we go through the year.
Now, I, I want you to ask. I want to ask you this question uh, about physical discipline and sticking to it. I, I know that uh, your predecessor did sit in that chair and complained about permanent secretaries and civil servants who have an insatiable appetite and propensity to cannibalize the budget. <laughs> For most of the time, <laughs> personal <laughs> benefit, trips. We, we, we still have those challenges. And I will not sit here pretending that we would have solved all those challenges. We still have some of the civil service that are focusing on issues of workshop, on issues of travel. We still have challenges in terms of implementing projects and programs for government. We still are going to have challenges in terms of ensuring that only money which is in the budget is spent. Those challenges, you know, will, will still going to continue to be there. But I think what government must be obsessed with is to continue to emphasize to the civil service that we cannot tolerate wastage of expenditure. We cannot tolerate leakages of, of expenditure. And that for the first time with the Public Finance Act, we are going to take action, including imprisonment for abuse of public resource, that will happen. Policy reversal, I mean, this is an issue you spoke about in the budget, and something you cited in, in, in Zambia Plus, in, in your introduction, as you spoke about it, that uh, unbalanced policy mix really affected uh, the recovery plan. And we're talking about policy reversal and sticking to policies. I know that this is proving to be difficult for you, maybe. No. Outside an example in the agricultural sector, your counterpart on the other side, for lack of a better word, still fighting with the grain traders on... On, on, on lifting the maize ban and, and keeping it in place? Uh, you did if, commit if, to lift it. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, yeah. If you recall, w we said the 2017-2018 budget, you know, agriculture season, we are going to ensure as part of the policy framework for agriculture that we're not going to have bans. And the Minister of Agriculture has emphasized this point. So whereas we may have bans now because this come from the previous season, but for the 2017-2018, we are determined to make sure that we do not entertain reversal of policies. And the Minister of Agriculture and the rest of government is very clear about that. As we close, uh, Minister, I want, I want to ask you, you, you've been around, you've been uh, up and about uh, Europe, and Washington. What, what has come out of your trips? Well, uh, we have been, for example, to Cordova with the ADB to engage with them in order to support the development agenda of Zambia, in order to support the budget. Our engagement with ADB resulted in us securing support in the energy sector. And indeed, Zambia has been selected as one of the nine countries where the African Development Bank are going to put critical resources to deal with the challenges in energy. So, for example, they are going to support us in our efforts to do the Zambia-Tanzania transmission interconnection. If we do this particular transmission interconnection, we shall be able to connect power from Cape to Cairo. We were in Europe with the EU, with the European Investment Bank. As part of that engagement, we got 40 million euro by way of grants, important for the development agenda for Zambia. We are also able to engage the private sector. Already we are having the private sector that are coming to test the opportunities that are available uh, in Zambia. We were in the UK. 
In the UK, we met with CDC, supporting the development of Kalunguishi Hydro. So these are critical engagements that are directed towards addressing the development challenge. And Gravajo, you can't expect if you don't engage. You have got to take the issues to the people that have got the resource and explain your circumstances and how you can work together with them to push the development agenda. And I can tell you, in Europe, in Africa, the support for Zambia Plus is tremendous. The levels of investment that we're going to see this year is going to be significant because the people are saying there are opportunities in Zambia that can be seized upon. There is a direction that President Lungu has taken in order to move the economy. He has got five years to be able, one, to take the tough decision, two, to achieve the stability, not only political stability, but economic stability and growth that is required in the next five years. And this is giving confidence, particularly to foreign investors. Stability is important. And that, he has said to me, Minister, continue to attract the investment, continue to secure grants, budget support, concessional finance, financing, and other forms of financing that are critical to address jobs, that are critical to address public investment, particular infrastructure in energy, in roads, and in logistics. And I think we are working on that path. Minister. It's not wandering around. I wish you well. Thank you. You've been watching Sunday interview, and our guest this evening was the Minister of Finance, Honorable Felix Mtaji. Till next week at the same time.